Well, in this session, we really want to deal with the issue of is there, in fact, a biblical mandate for us as pastors and elders to train elders and pastors in our churches? This obviously isn't the model that's commonly followed today. Most of the time, we send our young men off for training somewhere else. At most, our investment is to give them finances to make that possible. But is that a biblical model? That's the question we want to consider. Harvard College was founded in 1636 by a group of English Puritan pastors. It was the first higher learning school in America. And the primary purpose of these Puritan pastors was to train the next generation of pastors for their churches. In fact, these words appear on a wall just outside Johnston Gate at Harvard. After God had carried us safe to New England and we had built our houses, provided necessities for our livelihood, reared convenient places for God's worship, and settled the civil government, one of the next things we longed for and looked after was to advance learning and perpetuate it to posterity, dreading to leave an illiterate ministry to the churches when our present ministers shall lie in the dust." End quote. This was so much a part of the foundation of Harvard College that on September 26, 1642, they issued a pamphlet with rules for the students, and those rules included this one, quote, let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, and therefore to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. And seeing the Lord only gives wisdom, let everyone seriously set himself by prayer in secret to seek it of him. That's an amazing beginning. That, of course, raises the question in light of what we know Harvard stands for today, what happened at Harvard? Well, the last strong Puritan president was a man named Increase Mather, who served for 17 years. And himself, he was a good man, a solid man who believed the truth of the faith. Sadly, because of a number of absences where he was in England and other places, he failed in one key responsibility, and that was to train the next generation of leaders. As a result of that, his young colleagues began to regard him as out of touch with contemporary trends, too conservative. He was eventually removed from the presidency, and within seven years and two additional presidents, the school's mindset had quickly changed to one of open tolerance, and Harvard was changed forever. That's how Harvard died. It was the failure to invest in and train the next generation of leaders. Sadly, the same thing happens in many churches. Why is that? It's because the pastors or elders of those churches fail in the same way that Mather did to train the next generation of faithful men. Now, this duty that we all share is clearly directed to us and revealed in the pastoral epistles in First and Second Timothy and Titus. As you know, together these letters serve as an operations manual for pastoral ministry. Paul put it this way when he wrote his first letter to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. He says, In case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. Now, the clearest and most direct passage in which Paul addresses the elders' responsibility, the, the biblical mandate to train leadership, is a familiar one. It is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, where I want us to focus for the rest of our time together. If you'll look at how this passage begins, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, it begins with the word, therefore. 
Therefore, you, you of course is an emphatic address to Timothy, and the therefore is in contrast to how the previous chapter ended. Back in chapter 1, verse 15, we learned that there, were an, a, there was a long list of defectors from the faith, and Paul says, you, Timothy, in contrast to that, keep on being strengthened. It's interesting, later he uses the metaphors of, of being a soldier, an athlete, a farmer, He says, keep on being strengthened for the task that you've been called to. And then in verse 2, he gives the mandate for training those who, after Timothy, will faithfully carry on the ministry. Look at 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That is a truly amazing text with profound ramifications for how you and I do ministry. Because the focus of that text is Timothy's mandate. It's the church's mandate. It's our mandate. In that one verse, you'll notice there are four generations of church leaders. There's Paul, there's Timothy, his son in the faith, there's the faithful men that Timothy will teach, And then there are the others that those faithful men will in turn teach. Four generations. The clear picture is the passing of the baton, the baton of truth to each successive generation. But that raises a crucial question, and that is, who bears the responsibility before God to make sure that the next generation of leaders are equipped? This command is addressed in this text to, and the responsibility falls chiefly on, every local church. This was to happen in the context of the local church that Timothy himself pastored in the city of Ephesus. And it's supposed to happen in your church and in my church. In 1 Timothy 3 The entire church, every believer in the church, is called to be part of the process of of identifying and affirming the future leaders of the church. That's absolutely crucial. We live in a day when there are so many who decide on their own that they're gifted and called, and they they go to seminary on their own, and then they graduate, and they go go buy a storefront somewhere and set up a church, and they're they're self-called. The New Testament knows nothing of such lone lone rangers who have not been affirmed by the entire church as those who are gifted and qualified for ministry. But this command to, to make sure that elders and pastors are trained is addressed specifically not just to the the church in total, but to the leaders of every local church. To every senior pastor. Remember, this verse is addressed directly to Timothy, who served in that role in Ephesus. But it's also addressed to the rest of the elders who served with him in Ephesus. 1 Timothy 5.17 says there was a plurality of elders in the city of Ephesus where Timothy served. So this command then to train elders is a command to all who currently serve as elders in a local church. Please note that this is not a command to seminaries to train the next generation. This is not a command to elders and pastors to financially contribute so that a man can be trained somewhere else. This is a command to every elder to be personally engaged in training future elders, both those who will serve in that church and those by God's design who will serve in other churches in the days to come. So this this command is addressed to the church, to every local church, but to the leaders of every local church specifically. It is also addressed by implication to the future pastors or elders. All who desire to serve in this role are responsible to make sure that they are truly biblically equipped. If you're considering ministry as an elder in your church, this verse makes it clear that 
that you need to understand the importance of being thoroughly equipped. If on the other hand, you're, you're thinking that you may be gifted and called to full-time ministry, and if the elders agree with that, listen, seminary can play an important role in the process of preparing you for that future ministry. But your training must ultimately be also in a local church under elders who know you, shepherd you, affirm you, lay hands on you as one God has gifted and called. And you need to shoulder the responsibility to make sure that happens. So we all bear the responsibility to make sure that elders and pastors are trained. Paul's instructions here in 2 Timothy 2.2, can really be reduced to one simple proposition. Christ has given the pastors or elders of every local church the responsibility to identify and to train the next generation of the church's leaders. And in this passage, Paul does more than tell us it ought to happen. He lays out a framework. He tells us how we can carry out this crucial task. In fact, in this one verse, Paul explains to us four key principles for equipping the next generation. Let me give you the the structure, the outline of where we're going, and then we'll come back and look at each of them individually. Four key principles for equipping the next generation. First, employ the right method. Secondly, impart the right content. Thirdly, pick the right men. And number four, pursue the right goals. That's an overview of where we're headed in the remainder of our time. And all of that is included here in this amazing verse. So let's consider each of these key principles individually. First of all, employ the right method. Employ the right method. Of course, that raises the key question, what exactly is the right method? Well, it's contained in the main verb of this sentence. And it's translated with the English word entrust. Now the word entrust, you'll notice, is an imperative. It's a command. And the word itself is best translated as meaning to entrust something to someone for safekeeping and or for transmission. It's used that way in a number of texts in the New Testament. Take, for example, Luke chapter 23, verse 46. Jesus in his dying breath, says, I commit my spirit to you, Father. In Acts chapter 20, verse 32, Paul says to the Ephesian elders that he commends them to God, using this same word. In 1 Peter 4.19, we're told that those who suffer are to entrust their souls to a faithful Creator. We get some insight from what this word means based on its most frequent usage in both the New Testament and in the Septuagint. It's most often translated as meaning to set food before someone. For example, in 1 Corinthians 10, 27, if an unbeliever invites you to a meal, eat anything set before you. That's this word, entrust. So this word, you can see, came to be a metaphor for teaching for teaching by verbal instruction, and for teaching by personal example. Ultimately then, to entrust means to teach and to model. It means to disciple. That's exactly what Paul had done with Timothy, and it's what he commanded Timothy to do as well, not only in this text, but in others. For example, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, Verses 11 and 12, Paul tells Timothy, I want you to prescribe and teach these things, and I want you to be an example. I want you to teach, and I want you to model. Teach and model. In other words, I want you to disciple others. So what exactly does this method of entrusting, of teaching and modeling, what does it look like in real life? Well, your ministry is going to look different to different groups that you serve. In fact, I think a helpful way to consider it is this. Think of of your ministry to different groups as like a series of concentric circles with, with varying levels of intimacy and interaction. 
You understand that's how it worked in the ministry of Christ, right? I mean, he certainly served and ministered to all the disciples, that is, all of his followers. Then to the 70, there was, there was a different level of involvement. Then to the 12, yet more intimate and more active. And then even within the 12, Peter, James, and John have a unique place. In fact, when you, when you consider the 12, you see the variation that occurred among the apostles. When you look at the New Testament, there are four biblical lists of the apostles in Matthew 10, Mark 3, Luke 6, and Acts 1. And when you examine those four lists, you discover several things. You discover that there are always three groups, and those three groups always have the same four members. For example, group one always contains Peter, Andrew, James, and John. You also discover that the same name begins each of the three groups. In all three cases, the man whose name leads those three groups was apparently a leader among leaders. The three groups also reflect a decreasing level of intimacy to Christ. And then you discover that there were three in Jesus' inner circle— Peter, James, and John. Now, Jesus equipped all of these people, but the form and the intensity of that equipping varied based on their relationship to him and on his plans for their future. So, exactly what form did Jesus' teaching ministry take with all of those in his ministry? Well, first of all, when you look at all of his disciples in Mass, his ministry really focused on his public teaching ministry. That was how he ministered to the largest block of his disciples with occasional personal interaction. When it came to the 70, you see Jesus' ministry to them was, was a group training for ministry. Think, think like a seminar. When you come to the 12, there's a much more intimate involvement. Jesus' ministry to the 12 certainly included his public teaching, and, and I know from my own mentor that a great deal of the impact that he made on me was through his public teaching, and certainly that was true for Jesus' disciples, but his involvement with them went beyond his public teaching. There was also small group training. There was modeling, spending time together, accompanied them as he ministered, that is, they're accompanying him as he ministered. In other words, to the twelve, it was intentional discipleship beyond the public teaching. And then when you look at Peter, James, and John, you find that Jesus spent even more time with them, even more personal interaction. He even gave them special privileges. They alone, the three, accompanied him at the transfiguration, at the healing of the synagogue leader's daughter in in Mark 5, in Gethsemane, when he pulled away to pray, he took those three with him. And so you can see that although Jesus loved all of his followers and trained and equipped them all, he did so at different levels depending on their gifting, calling, and future ministry. So when we think about that, how should we apply that concept to our own ministries? Well, understand that we are called as pastors and elders, to equip everyone in our churches. But like Christ, the form and intensity will vary. We equip everyone in our ministries by our public teaching. All of them are further equipped, as, as Ephesians 4 describes it. We are, by our ministry, equipping all the saints to do the work of service. All those who serve in leadership, in various ministries in our church. We're responsible to, to be involved in their lives. But, but it's at a different level, just like it was for Christ, when we're talking about elders and potential elders, and when we're talking about those who believe they are and we believe are called to pastoral ministry. Like Christ, we must be even more deliberate in ministering to them, pouring ourselves into them, we must train them by teaching and modeling. We must disciple them. And men, this is not 
a suggestion. This is a biblical mandate. Again, 2 Timothy 2.2, in trust is an imperative for Timothy and for all pastors and elders. So the first key principle then for equipping the next generation of church leaders is to employ the right method. That is teaching with verbal instruction and teaching by example, that is intentional discipleship. But what exactly are we to teach and model? What is the curriculum? Well, that brings us to a second key principle, and that is impart the right content. What are we responsible to entrust to the next generation? Well, you'll notice in verse 2, Paul begins with the direct object of the sentence. The verb is entrust, but he, he begins with the direct object. And so read it that way. Verse 2, I want you to entrust the things which you have heard from me. The things which you have heard from me. That means all that Timothy had heard from Paul over the years. Timothy was almost certainly converted on Paul's first missionary journey, and he joined Paul for the other missionary journeys. He was with Paul during his first imprisonment, Caesarea, the two years that Paul spent there. He ministered with Paul in Ephesus for the almost three years Paul served as a pastor in that church. And it was to Ephesus that Paul eventually sent Timothy to pastor. That's where he was when he received the letters first and second Timothy. By that time, by the time he read this letter, Timothy had been Paul's disciple for more than 20 years. There was so much that he had learned from Paul. But Paul doesn't mean some general sense of principles that he learned from him as a, as a human pastor. In the New Testament, Paul's words bear a much greater authority. And to make that point, you'll notice he adds in verse 2, the things which you heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. Paul means what Timothy had heard him teach authoritatively, what was supported by the confirming testimony of other teachers and leaders. In other words, he's saying, Timothy, what you learn from me in my teaching of the Scripture. This is clear back in chapter 1. In chapter 1, verse 14, Paul refers to all that teaching as a treasure that God had entrusted to Timothy. Literally, the, the Greek text says, guard the good deposit which has been entrusted to you. This is what had been given to Timothy. This was what Paul means in chapter 2, verse 2. But what exactly was that good deposit that had been entrusted to Timothy? Look at chapter 1, verse 13. It's the standard of sound words which you heard from me. So Paul is directing Timothy to invest himself in men who will guard and pass on the treasure. I love the image behind these words. The picture is of a family treasure, a family heirloom that's been passed down through the generations. Most of us have some kind of family heirloom or treasure in our homes. As the last of ten kids, there wasn't much left for me, but I have a couple, and one of them is my grandfather's railroad watch. I have it displayed on my mantle, and I'll pass it on to my children Paul says the truth of the Christian faith in the Scripture is like a great family treasure, but one of incalculable value. Those before us, they deposited that treasure with us. And what are we to do with that treasure? Well, if you go back to chapter 1, verse 13 says we're to teach the truth that is that treasure. Retain the standard of sound words that is in your teaching. Secondly, we're to live the truth. Verse 13 goes on to say, keep the pattern of sound words. We're to guard the truth. Verse 14 says, guard the good deposit. And here we're learning in chapter 2, verse 2, we're to pass that treasure, the truth, on to others. Entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. 
Paul's point is that when you set out to train men, don't take them to a seminar that's teaching the latest fad sweeping the church. Don't give them a book written by some management guru teaching warmed-over secular business practices. Instead, use the divinely inspired curriculum. The Scripture is the definitive shepherd's manual we must teach. Sadly, we live in a generation when that's simply not happening. More and more churches are failing to guard and to pass on the treasure of sound doctrine. The only way to ensure that the next generation is faithful is to pass the same treasure that we received, the treasure of sound doctrine, the treasure that was passed down to us as a great family heirloom, to pass that treasure on to the next generation. So to equip the next generation, we must employ the right method. We must impart the right content. That is, we must give them the truth of Scripture that we receive, the sound doctrine that has been taught to us. Thirdly, we learn in this text that we must pick the right men. Verse 2 says, Entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Choose faithful men. Now, first of all, notice that it's men. The, the Greek word is anthropois, the plural of anthropos, sometimes used generically for mankind. But since here it refers to those who can teach and train other men, it obviously excludes women. In 1 Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 5, 17, those who labor at teaching and preaching in the church are elders. And elders, according to Titus 1, 9, are men. Men also, you'll notice, is in the plural here, faithful men. The goal is for there to be more than one in each church. That's the New Testament pattern. That's the pattern in the church Timothy was pastoring when he received this letter. In 1 Timothy 5, 17, it's clear that in Ephesus, in the church that Timothy pastored, there were elders, some who were paid, others who were not. There was a plurality of godly men leading the church. We also see this in Acts chapter 20, verses 17 and 28. There Paul is addressing the Ephesian elders, plural, of the church in Ephesus, singular. Paul tells us to entrust the treasure only to faithful men. That means we need to select certain men, just like Jesus did. You remember in Luke 6, 13, Jesus chose 12 after a full night of prayer. In Mark 3, 13, He summoned those whom He Himself wanted. Of course, like our Lord, we should immerse this whole process of, of picking the right men with, with prayer. But the question is specifically, how do we go about choosing the men with whom we will deposit the treasure of sound doctrine for the next generation? Well, ultimately, of course, as you know, we don't pick them. Christ does. But how do we identify the men that Christ has already chosen? Well, here in our passage, Paul gives three criteria to help us choose wisely. Three criteria to pick the right men. First of all, they must be men of commitment. They must be faithful men. That means we know enough about these men that we can affirm that they are faithful and able to teach. Now, this is really important because a lot of pastors and elders fail on this front. By saying they must be faithful men, Paul is saying they must be men who already have shown commitment in the life and ministry of the church. Men that the pastor or elders and the entire church know well enough to affirm. That's why the warning in 1 Timothy 5.22, do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourself free from that kind of sin, Paul says, that, that hastiness in choosing someone to be in leadership. But again, don't miss the crucial point here. This verse clearly implies that the training of elders must happen within the context of the church. 
There's a crucial role for seminaries, but they're to help the local church. It is primarily the church's responsibility to choose the men who will take the baton for the next generation. The church is to preach the truth, model the truth, and serve as a laboratory for future elders and pastors to demonstrate the commitment to what they're learning in the classroom. So choose men of commitment. A second criterion in this verse is they must be men of character. Paul says in verse 2, they must be faithful men. These men must not merely be believers. They must be reliable. They must be dependable in their character. Men who can be trusted to guard the treasure. Negatively, that means they're not going to neglect the truth for their own ideas. They're not going to distort the truth because they've been careless in their hermeneutics and their interpretation. And positively, they can be trusted to accurately handle the word of truth. Now, why is it important for these men to be faithful? Well, just look at the rest of the letter. There are many, according to chapter 1, verse 15, who defect from the faith. According to chapter 2, verse 18, there are leaders who go astray from the truth. Chapter 2, verse 25, there are unbelievers who obviously will oppose the truth. Some church leaders will oppose the truth, according to chapter 3, verse 8. And in chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, an entire church's membership may come to a point where they turn from the truth and don't want to endure sound doctrine. So these men must be faithful men. They must be those who are willing to stand with the treasure they've received and to guard it even when everyone else capitulates, even when everyone else runs. They must be men of character. There's one additional criterion for picking the right men. Not only must they be men of commitment and men of character, but thirdly, they must be men of capacity. Paul says they must be faithful men, notice, who are able to teach others. The Greek word translated able means sufficient for a task, competent, qualified. They are sufficient, they are qualified, they are competent to teach. This isn't mere human capacity to communicate. It means these men have been gifted by God with a teaching gift, as Peter describes it in 1 Peter 4, 11, 10 and 11. They must have a teaching gift. They must be competent, notice, to teach others. Now, this is, this is really important Because you'll notice Paul is looking beyond the current generation in this verse. We aren't to think solely about our church and its current needs, or even the churches these faithful men will pastor. But rather, we're to look beyond that to those these faithful men will teach and disciple. Our perspective is to be long-range. We're responsible to pick men who will be able to carry on the process of teaching, living, guarding, and passing on the treasure to the next generation. Now, if, if you're a man thinking about ministry, if you're thinking you want to pursue ministry, this is the kind of man you must be like. A man who's committed to the local church, to your local church, who is reliable in in what you're assigned, who is trustworthy in how you handle the treasure of the truth, and one who's been gifted to teach. And the elders and the church affirm those realities. So we must, as elders and pastors, pick the right men. And listen carefully, they are within our churches. They are within our churches. That's what Paul says is commanding Timothy to do. He says, I want you to look in your congregation, and I want you to select faithful men to whom you can pass the treasure. This happens not bringing people in from outside the church primarily. This happens raising up men within the church. Even successful secular companies understand the importance of raising up key leadership from within. 
Years ago, I read a, a business book entitled Built to Last. The authors of that book studied 18 leading, enduring American companies, and they found that leadership was the key to long-term success. That's not a surprise. But this is a surprise. They found that of these 18 successful American companies, they get their leadership from within. In fact, in 1,700 collective years, the time the book was written, these 18 leading American firms had only hired top management from outside four times in 1,700 collective years. They raised up leadership from within. Those who understood the priorities, the values of the company. Now, the church is not a secular organization. Our mandate is not from a, a well-written management book or some guru or a corporate model. It's from the Word of God. But building leadership from within is the biblical model. That's what Scripture lays down as the mechanism, the tool to ensure lasting ministry as well. So the church is responsible to equip the next generation. To do so, we must employ the right method. We must impart the right content. And we must pick the right men. Finally, we must pursue the right goals. Pursue the right goals. Notice verse 2 says, I want you to select those and entrust to those who will be able to teach others also. Will be able points to the future. It describes after they have been equipped, after they've been trained, here is the final product we should be looking for and demanding. When the equipping is over, this should be the result. He tells us exactly in this phrase what the result should be. These equipped men, when they have been fully equipped, they will have, first of all, ministry skills. They will have ministry skills. They will be able to teach. That means they'll be competent, sufficient, skilled in teaching. In other words, we're going to help them in our equipping and training to refine the gift of teaching they have received from God. It's exactly what Paul demanded of Timothy in 1 Timothy 4. In fact, look at that text, 1 Timothy 4. As Paul anticipated not being able to come as quickly as he wanted, he said this in 1 Timothy 4, 13, until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. Give attention to these things. And he summarizes the public ministry of the Word as reading the Scripture, explaining the Scripture, and exhorting or applying the Scripture. Read the Scripture, explain the Scripture, apply the Scripture. He says, Timothy, that's your job. That's the skill you have. But notice he goes on to say in verse 15, take pains with these things. Be Literally, be in them. Be absorbed in them. Live in them. Why? Verse 15, so that your progress will be evident to all. That's what Paul demanded of Timothy, that he would continue to grow in the use of the gift he had received in verse 14, and the laying on of hands of the elders, that he'd continue to grow in the manifestation of that gift so that the people he served and ministered to would see his progress in teaching. Well, that's not only what Timothy was called to do. That's what we as pastors and elders of local churches are called to do with the men we're entrusting the treasure to, the men we're equipping and preparing. We are to help them refine the, the ministry skills necessary for ministry. And at the heart of that, of course, is teaching. But there are other ministry skills that we need to equip them as well. A second goal that we ought to pursue in this process is biblical and theological knowledge. Again, verse 2 says they are skilled in teaching. But teaching what? Go back to the beginning of verse 2. The things which you heard from me. In other words, the Scripture, the things you heard from me, 
You heard me teach in public my ministry of the Word. So this is a call to make sure that that the men we are pouring our lives into, the men we are equipping, the elders we are preparing, that they know the Scripture. And that means two things. That means they know the content of Scripture. They know what Scripture teaches and where. And they know the theology of Scripture. That is, they know how one passage relates to another and and can contrast and compare and show how they synchronize together. That's systematic theology. And so the requirement here is that when we have finished training these men to serve as elders in our church or another church, they are knowledgeable in the content of the Scripture. They ought to know what the themes of the book of the Bible are. They ought to know where the key passages are, the key chapters, and what are taught. They ought to have a full comprehensive knowledge of the Scripture beyond that of their members. And they need to understand systematic theology, how the truth of Scripture relates, contrasts, and compares from different places within the Scripture. There's a third goal we should be aiming at, not only the ministry skills that are necessary, not only biblical and theological knowledge, but thirdly, spiritual character. Able to teach others implies more than having the skill to communicate, implies more than even having the knowledge of what needs to be taught. Because in the New Testament, an essential part of what makes a man qualified to teach and train others for ministry is his character. So implied in this statement is that he must have the character qualities of an elder, spelled out in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. Because a man who has all the skills required for ministry and a head full of biblical and theological knowledge, but who lacks spiritual character, is not able to teach. So those are the goals of equipping the next generation. As we think about equipping the elders in our churches, as we think about equipping Uh, those who will serve full-time in ministry in our churches or in another church, we must commit to giving them pastoral ministry skills. We must commit to making sure they have biblical and theological knowledge that is, in the words of Titus 1, not only able to to hold forth the, the sound teaching, but able to refute those who are in error. And we must ensure that in the end they have the spiritual character that qualifies them to lead God's people. In the end, when you think about this job that Paul has assigned us here in 2 Timothy 2.2, you can summarize it in the words of our Lord in Luke 6 verse 40. A pupil is not above his teacher. Here it is. But everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. That's the goal. That's the goal, to take everything that has been entrusted in you and entrust it to the next generation of leaders. It's like Paul with Timothy. I love what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 17. I have sent to you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, And he will remind you of my ways which are in Christ, just as I teach everywhere in every church. Timothy was just like the one who discipled him. He could give every congregation a sense of exactly what Paul would tell them if he was there, because he had been fully equipped and trained. Paul could send Timothy in his place. I like the way John MacArthur summarizes this passage and the goal. He puts it like this, We all receive the truth from faithful men before us, and we are to preserve it so that it is passed on accurately and fully to the next generation. Man, that is Christ's mandate to your church, to my church. But it gets even more personal than that. Because what Paul is saying to Timothy was the command to a pastor, to an elder. And so if you serve as a pastor or elder, 
This is your duty. This is your responsibility. It's not the seminary's responsibility. They can come alongside and help you, but this is a duty we have that Christ has laid on us to fulfill. This is the biblical mandate for training elders. So, understanding that as the responsibility we have, the question is, what should you do next? How do you start this process if it's not already in in place in your life and ministry? First of all, begin by praying with the rest of the church's leaders for wisdom to identify the right men. Pray. Jesus, before he picked the men that he chose as his disciples, prayed all night. Pray with the fellow leaders in your church for wisdom from God to identify the right men in whom to pour the future of the church. Secondly, select men based on the qualifications of commitment, character, and capacity into whom you will pour your life. And let me just stop and say, that list of men begins with those who are already elders. In most churches, the lay elders have not been equipped to serve. They don't know how to do ministry. They don't have ministry skills. They don't have the biblical and theological knowledge that the pastor has, and they don't, they don't understand how they're supposed to carry out these duties. So it starts by training the elders that already exist. And then, as we add additional elders to the elder board in our churches, training them, making sure they're trained as well. And obviously, potential future elders and pastors. Number three, develop a core curriculum that will equip them. A curriculum that walks through the pastoral skills involved, that will give them a full biblical and theological knowledge of the Scripture, and that will equip them to be the spiritually minded men they ought to be, that they have the spiritual character required. This is something that we have worked at doing here at Countryside for many years. And as part of the fruit of that, I'm so grateful that there are now a couple of really helpful tools to help you set up this core curriculum. Two practical workbooks that are available free of charge from Excel Ministries to help you do exactly this, to train your existing elders and future elders and pastors. Two very practical workbooks that you can you can take and walk through with men you want to equip and train. You have to have a core curriculum. And number, th- number four, begin entrusting these things to the men that you've chosen using the various means that Christ used. Your public preaching, group training, small group discussions, deliberate discipleship, having them with you as you minister in various places, whether it's a hospital visit or doing a funeral, and just spending time together with them. This is the duty that is laid on us. This is the biblical mandate that you have and that I have. Now, when I read this verse, when I think about all that I've just walked through with you, it raises the question of, Who is adequate for these things? Who is capable of doing this? And that's why I love the encouragement that Paul gives us. Look back in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. He says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Literally, as one Greek scholar puts it, keep on being empowered by means of the grace that comes from Christ. Keep on being empowered by means of the grace that comes from Christ. Of course, grace is God's unmerited, enabling power, which not only saves us, but which strengthens us to live the Christian life, and more more immediately appropriate to our passage, enables us to minister effectively. The only way this happens is if we keep on being empowered by means of the grace that comes from Christ Himself. And that's how we can carry out the biblical mandate to train elders. 
Existing elders and future elders. Look at it again. 2 Timothy 2.2 The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Let's pray together. Our Father, who is sufficient for this task? Who is adequate for these things? We thank You that we can do this through the strength that's provided in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what You've called us to do. This is the mandate we have. Father, forgive us as pastors and elders, and and forgive us even as churches for, for somehow assuming that this is not our duty, that this is not our responsibility, and simply seeking others who will do this in our place. Lord, forgive us and help us to own again, as the church has always owned, the responsibility within the church to train and equip elders to serve. Lord, thank You for the tools that are available to us, particularly for those who are pursuing full-time ministry. We thank You for seminaries. We thank You for faithful ones where men are trained. But Father, help us to see that as simply one tool in our toolbox that we can use with the responsibility and mandate we've been given as pastors and elders to train the next generation. Lord, may we be committed to preach the truth, to live the truth, to guard the truth, and to pass it on to the next generation. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.